cuts. Uh, but we're really believing in education that we can make a difference. And I think we come to education a lot of the time with that, expect bit, with that expectation, but sometimes it eludes us. And it's also about confidence. It's about building the confidence that we can do our jobs properly. And as I said, we can make a difference. And it's about building that trust, that trust in each other. Talking to Michael uh, before that, when you, when you build that individual confidence and belief uh, that something can be done, people grow in that confidence and they start to become inspired. And when people become inspired, everything that we're working on seems to become easier. All the hard things that we know have to be done become easier. And then truly there's that synergy, synergy and people uh, really start to believe amazing things can happen. And we become greater than the sum of our parts as a collective teaching team. And seemingly ordinary people work hard together and achieve the extraordinary. Uh, and we see movies written about this stuff. And, and I really just have this idea of wanting to, to do things together and improve each other and, and drag our kids and communities along with us, no matter where it is that we are. And this is why it's measured in our system. And I'll share a few of those measurements later uh, because it's linked to school performance and uh, so many indicators of um, positive student outcomes. But it must be built. And we contrast this to when belief isn't there and we don't believe that we can do our jobs properly. And we know that we can get to pretty dark places very quickly and, and in very hopeless situations. So I want to focus tonight uh, and share, sorry, I'm just trying to work out. Oh, there we go. Uh, I want to focus tonight and share how Bentley West Primary School has used an evidence based as a foundation to build collective efficacy, to help shape and that belief. I've spent the last six years immersing myself in the learning science. This is because we have at Bentley West Primary School to become an evidence-informed school. And the educational research has helped guide what to focus on and what to steer away from. And I've engaged in all the training that our, our staff have encountered. And I need to do this because I need to grow to be able to lead them. So I've got a model and learn so I can lead. Sorry, I've just got to, there we go. So I'd like to share some of the learnings that I've had uh, along the way and, uh, and build this as an idea of, of how to build, build belief um, in our school communities. So the first thing is we know that teachers matter. We know that outside of the home, uh, teachers have the greatest impact on student outcomes. So in teach, investment in teacher development is a relatively, relatively uncontested idea, yet so, much, so many inflated PD budgets and focus on teacher development seem to bear little fruit. I really want to explore that idea and have a look at four main areas that teachers uh, are really asked to engage in with their performance and development plans and what they're uh, held accountable for. I want to look at planning. Uh, I want to look at the classroom environment. I want to look at instruction and professional uh, responsibility. Explore this idea that the classroom environment and instruction are the areas of the biggest bang for our buck and how can we develop systems around that to ensure that our teachers are focusing on what's the most, gives them the, the biggest chance of shifting student outcomes. I also want to look at some research that uh, novices uh, and experts and how they learn. I was just talking to Michael off, off air <laughs> before, uh, we need to understand that our professional development that we uh, put in front of our students needs to be as evidence informed as the learning that our students encounter. So I want to look at uh, some of Sweller's research and Kirsten's research. Uh, on how novice learners need explicit and guided instruction, they need repetition and they need practice. And I'd like to also um, explore this idea. We know that limiting teacher variance is really, really important. Richard Almore came over in the early 2000s and we understood that the difference between our lowest performing teachers and our highest performing teachers can be quite stark. And how do we lift that teacher development and how do we make it so our novice teachers and our graduate teachers can come in and have an impact almost from one and can we de develop systems around that to ensure that that occurs. And how do we build shared responsibility to give the best chance to benefit from cumulative learning? 
so many times we set targets around student learning and it might be in grade three and grade four. And let's say it's a reading target or a, or a writing target. But if our people from foundation haven't developed correct handwriting and put the hard work in to get effects, how can we ask one individual teacher to uh, shift the learning and things like that? So how do we get this idea of a prep to six uh, in my situation at Bentley West Primary School ownership that if, if something doesn't occur or a goal doesn't occur, it's a whole school problem, not just individual learning teams. And lastly, uh, that seeing is believing, that when teachers engage uh, in, in teaching, when they see it in their own class and they see uh, what is possible, that that builds uh, confidence and belief as well. So hopefully I can uh, leave you tonight uh, with some sort of uh, idea that the evidence helps us as teachers. And firstly, I would like to give a small example of trying to improve reading instruction. And I think this example is one small element of reading instruction, but I think that's illustrative of how we're trying to work and, and a model that we've tried to replicate uh, outside of reading instruction as well. So this statement is from the summary of the reading panels report in the USA, and it's very, very effective. I'll give you a chance just to read that for a sec. And first of all, we broke this into its, into its constituent parts. So we've got systematic phonics, uh, clearly part of this uh, statement, and explicit instruction. These two ideas are very central to the theme. We've also got effective, and I'm gonna leave this a little bit. I, I would like to talk about the, but uh, Sarah Soames gonna pick up on these uh, points with assessment uh, later on. So I'll stick to these two central ideas of systematic phonics and explicit instruction. So it was clear that the what to teach uh, was the systematic phonics and the how to teach it was the explicit, explicit instruction. At Bentley West Primary School, we were not very confident that we understood what systematic phonics meant. And we also uh, were very rubbery on what explicit instruction might mean. And we know in education that we do suffer from different meanings for different terms uh, when we're looking at uh, educational terms. So explicit instruction might mean one thing to one teacher, might mean another thing to another, and the same with uh, the content knowledge. So, sorry. So we can see that the what to teach is important, but when we overlay what we understand about professional development, just developing teacher content knowledge in this area isn't always a guarantee to shift teacher, uh, student, student outcomes. So just talking about this isn't sufficient. And we've also got this thing called teacher pedagogical knowledge where we integrate the teacher content knowledge and also how to teach it. How do we break it down into its constituent parts? How do we explicitly teach it step by step? How do we get that consolidation around it? So the what needs to be integrated with the how. And I want to take us back to these four main areas of, of teaching again. So we engaged in, in professional development and there's lots of ways to, to engage in that professional development. Uh, and the first thing that we got when we engaged in this professional development, a scope and sequence. We had a, a, a rigorously thought out scope and sequence that has been developed by experts. We had daily times uh, set out as, as when we should teach it to 15 to 20 minutes. And we also had the suggestion that we should be bringing in around about three phonemes a week. So there was an example of uh, planning that was already thought of and put in front of our teachers so they could engage. The classroom environment was very direct as well. We needed whole class instruction. We needed routines to support attention and active engagement. So that was also very directive uh, from our training. Finally, we look at the instruction. It was clear whole class lesson structure it was teacher led, there were supportive materials, there was reviews, uh, review and consolidation materials such as uh, flashcards and all those sorts of things. And we were trained in the specific learning content on how to deliver those lessons. And finally, as a principal, I could build professional responsibilities around uh, the goals and the targets that I wanted our teachers to engage in. So for me, uh, to be able to design those goals, very directive in the in the professional development that our teachers were it took a whole uh, load off so if we look at that 
our teachers said that the planning was basically uh, done for them. They had a very clear idea of what to focus on. And that allowed them to focus on classroom environment, which means developing a safe, uh, engaging environment for the kids to, to learn in, and then a clear idea of what their instruction was, and that gave them the greatest chance of impact. And the research supports that in our uh, evidence-based professional development as well. So, could this method be replicated and out across the whole school. These are the sorts of ideas that were rattling around in my head as a principal because it seemed to work so well. And again, if we look at the cognitive research, uh, there's answers to help guide your decisions. Now, phonics in instruction is not biological primary knowledge. Uh, so we know that what that means is that uh, according to evolutionary psychologist uh, David Geary, um, we have less chance of learning uh, this type of knowledge called biological, prim uh, biological uh, phonics knowledge by mere exposure. So it's not like learning to talk or learning to walk or something like that, where we can just be exposed and we've got brain structures that can kind of hyper, hyper learn these sorts of things by mere exposure. Phonics instruction comes into what's called biological secondary knowledge. And that's not to say that this isn't important to our, our, our survival. It's important for our culture. So reading is a, is a, a skill that we, is very important to be able to uh, exist in our culture, but it's not tied to our individual uh, survival, so to, so to speak. And it goes through a different system. And we know that this type of knowledge requires experience teaching on behalf of the teacher and attention and active engagement on behalf of the learner. So uh, can this be uh, replicated to other areas? Well, when we need to categorise what other areas in our school come under biological cult uh, secondary knowledge uh, or cultural knowledge, it's almost everything we teach at school. So yes, it's a good idea to uh, explicitly teach things in a systematic way. So with explicit teaching uh, coming up, we really understood at Bentley West, we need a, a common understanding of what explicit direct instruction um, or explicit instruction was. So we uh, engaged uh, one of the LDA favourites, uh, Lorraine Hammond, who came and gave, gave us a presentation on uh, Hollingsworth and Yabara's explicit direct instruction. It's got a book. So already we could uh, engage in the one-off PD with uh, Lorraine Hammond, who came down to our school and gave a, a wonderful, uh, wonderful whole day's PD. But we know that's not enough. We know we've got to keep engaging with that. So we had a book that we could go through deeper. And I've just put on the screen there each area of this, um, this EDI, EDI model. So what I love about uh, explicit direct instruction is it operationalises much operationalizes much that's in the educational research. So an example of that um, would be that uh, the, the review. So we know that multiple exposures, spaced interleave practice, and all those sorts of things are really important to learning. Um, that's already activated in our, in our, our lesson. So our novice learners can activate, uh, can engage with explicit direct instruction on the surface which means they just need to get, learn to get through lessons. They just need to understand what this I do, the you do, the we do, uh, sorry, the I do, we do, you do, and what 80% proficiency means to move, to move to independent practice. And our RTI model picks up uh, the, the other 20% that I'll let Sarah uh, talk about. But we've also got depth. To, we can also go deeper. We've got an example of that would be Dave Morcunis, who did a presentation with the LDR, LDR on review. He's gone in and looked at the research. I've set research readings and things like that. So at every level, uh, we can go deeper. Prior knowledge and relevance, we're really looking at that for deep processing skills and things. So not only can we engage that with our novice learners at the surface level, we can go deeper and become more sophisticated as we go through. Sure. So it doesn't go away. It, 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 it's there as part of something we do at Bentley West um, at Primary School. So we also have a very clear idea of our engagement norms, which um, also she, we understand how we need to active engage, 
actively engage our kids. We have attention norms that we know are so important to that, uh, that biological system of um, working memory and transfer to long-term memory. And we've got uh, what that looks like and what that means within our classrooms. And this supports our instruction in our classroom environment and behavior. And it also gives us clear targets for coaching and observation and improvement in those areas as well. So it's another uh, idea there with that shared understanding of an evidence-based approach that we can go deeper than just, um, just the, the one-off PD and, and hoping people pick up on it. It's ingrained in our practice and it's something that uh, we keep revisiting over again. So with a shared instructional model uh, and uh, an idea class environment uh, looks like. Um, what about the planning? I did say earlier that if we can get our experts onto planning uh, and take a lot of that load uh, away from our, our novices and build proficiency, proficiency in this area, we can provide a lot more focus on, on what really matters. So how can we lighten the load? So what we did is we got our key experts to break down what we call um, key understandings. So we went through each of these uh, areas in our English and our, um, and our mathematics, and we've done it for other areas as well. I'm just using these two as an example. And we really wanted to have some key understandings that we would at Bentley West Primary School put hand on heart, say that these students will get these skills to automaticity uh, so we can start building on complexity year after year. So I'll give you an example of what that might look like. So if we look at number and algebra, uh, you open up a document and it's got everything that we need uh, in there. This is just one page with place value. There's other uh, areas that we need to look at as well. But just to give an illustration of what we, what we look at, we wanted a viable curriculum. And what we were finding was 75% of our time in planning was, what was being used to try and interpret the curriculum and then uh, develop our resources and all these sorts of things. So we wanted to make that time so we could actually talk about lessons. So if we look at uh, going across, we wanted that predict experience where we actively built up complexity. So for an example, we were doing persuasive uh, topics earlier uh, when I first got here in 2015. And I saw in grade three, we would teach the paragraph starters firstly, secondly, thirdly, and then concluding statement. And then I would see in grade four, firstly, secondly, thirdly, you know, so we were repeating and teaching the same things. We're all also teaching in blocks meant that um, we were, were missing out on that complexity. So we wanted to write in really clearly what the complexity looked like as we go up this way. We also wanted the year on year depth so people could understand what a year would look like. So we're not too different to any other schools that have engaged in that, that learning. Uh, a lot of schools have done uh, that, that type of map mapping. So I wanted to go one step further with the leadership team. And I said, I want a term, term week by week breakdown, lesson by lesson breakdown to put into people's planners. So there's no ambiguity about what is expected for them to, to be planning so they can focus on what to teach rather than how to teach it. So we broke down, this is week one week. And you can see that we can take something out of uh, over here and it, follows and ends up in this, 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 term, this weekly planner, which is called our low variance curriculum document, which means that every teacher in that team level is to, is to teach that same concept, um, basically at the same time. So this is one strategy we took to try and build it in to make sure that what we did in the planning and what we had scoped out for our teachers actually made it to the classroom and in front of the kids. So further to that, we also identified when that lesson would be taught in their personal daily uh, timetables. So uh, teachers would see, this is what my is gonna look like. All I need to do now is look at how I'm going to teach that. But to further ensure that it becomes alive uh, into, the, into the classrooms, we also have now a bank of, less, of lessons uh, that might be linked to that topic for people to start with. So it, these uh, example lessons are lessons that could almost go straight into the learning program. So if you've got a novice teacher, they could pretty much use this. It's set to our EDI model. And you can see we've got the activate prior knowledge there. 
we've got our concept development and we've got the activities and that's all been linked to our book of research and Stephen Norton and, and being broken down by our experts uh, for, for each team member to go through and give us feedback. So this is where I think the professional development, what's shown in the research is we're not only teaching EDI, we're teaching EDI also in the domains that we needed. Now, if we look at a generalist teacher, we need to be experts in English, maths, geography, all those areas. So having this scaffolded approach to apply EDI to actual specific content areas really helps the teachers develop that domain specific knowledge or that pedagogical knowledge that's needed to improve. Um, so a novice learner has a great chance of just being able to go through a, a lesson like this and have great impact straight away. We've also seen CRTs be able to be really effective and even myself, if I go down there and don't know the kids, I can, I can really be effective um, by running through these, these lessons. But we also have the proficiency to develop further training. So once people uh, really get into this, if they want to look at uh, mathematics development, look at George Booker, look at Stephen Norton, look at the bar model and things like that, um, they can uh, we can activate uh, a professional development for them and they become and start to contribute back and they start to tweak things and, and we get um, feedback. So after teachers have developed these lessons or gone through these uh, lessons, uh, we get feedback. So we get feedback on how the low variance curriculum is going. Is there too much? Uh, do we need to shift things around? Do we need to ramp it up? So we collect that feedback from our teachers and it makes a whole school decision on if, if we need to take concepts out or we need to accelerate concepts and all, all those sorts of things. So again, there's a shared belief and understanding on, on what we're doing. So I said that collective efficacy could be um, measured and it's a good indicator as to uh, how, how schools are traveling. So over the past uh, three years, we've seen our collective efficacy rise from 84% to 90%. That's measured by a staff opinion survey and it's done by positive endorsement. But I'm not just interested in that. I'm also interested in uh, some of the statements that lead towards this. So collective focus on student learning. Like, why wouldn't we want everyone to be focused on that? You can see we've gone from positive endorsement from 87% to 98%. And I've just thrown the similar schools in there as well, because that's always interesting. We, we know that we're not comparing apples with apples uh, across our system. Uh, we've got guaranteed and viable curriculum. This was an area we really uh, needed to target. And you can see that's gone from 63% to 99%. So our teachers are really uh, believing that uh, that capacity is built in uh, to what we're doing and they've um, shifted and, and been able to focus on what gives us the biggest bang for our buck. And, uh, and the most important one, the one that I love, the, an energised environment with trust in our colleagues, we've gone from 78 to 96%. They know because seeing's believing, as I said before, they can go into a grade two class or a grade three class and they can see this curriculum being taught to automaticity. So they don't have to back over things that the students have um, simply forgotten. You've seen David's review, uh, David uh, present on reviews and our review processes here. So we know that we are shifting long-term memory and building uh, knowledgeable students and giving them the best chance to uh, move into more complex work as we move up. And teacher collaboration, 54% to 84%. That's a really uh, huge lift as well, where uh, you know, we've got something to collaborate about. We're building knowledge to collaborate uh, about and having really meaningful discussions about the things that matter. And shielding and buffering, uh, you know, are we making sure that all the distractions that come with the school are, are getting out of the way so the teachers can focus on what they're doing? Also really important. And this is where our office staff, support staff and all those sorts of things really can buy in. And we really acknowledge and celebrate their efforts to ensure that our teachers and our leaders can focus on the actual learning in the classroom um, with the kids as well. And our support teams and wellbeing teams and welfare teams to ensure that we're really building things with um, behaviour management support and things like that. But I'll let Sarah probably talk about that more when she has her um, presentation. So I'd like to thank you. Um, I hope uh, I've, uh, I'm right on uh, pretty much the, the 30 minutes there. Uh, I thank you for listening. Um, I hope you've been able to follow me. I know I jump around a bit. Um, I hope I've given a sense of how the science of learning can build confidence and give us a platform uh, not only for our teachers, but our school leaders. It's certainly the more I learn, the more 
I feel uh, supported by my decisions and more vindicated in the decisions because I've got the, the weight of the science to, to back us up. Um, I've got wonderful colleagues that we can also learn from and uh, we can develop sustained and continual improvement. Um, and Sarah will follow, Sarah Sohm will follow with our, our RTI model at some stage um, and assessment uh, in another presentation. So I hope that was useful. I hope I didn't just speed through it and people could um, keep up and uh, I'm more than happy to hang around for some questions. Thanks, Steve. Can I start with a question for you? Yes. Um, we, we don't have many there yet, but normally people start cranking them up once you're finished. Um, yep. My question is, do, have you had uh, much recognition from your department in Victoria? And I guess you have to be careful how you answer that. But yeah. <laughs> the second part to that is, um, is, there, is there developing a culture of other um, principals wanting to come and check out what you're doing, particularly around evidence-based approaches? Is, is that happening in, in Victoria? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I'm very uh, lucky. We've got a, a great network, the Sage Network, and uh, we've received some uh, some recognition on year on year improvement, particularly for our maths instruction. So we have been asked by uh, our department to be involved in a, a couple of network wide uh, uh, projects in mm -hmm. teaming up and sharing knowledge in observations and, and things like that. So that has been recognised by, by the department in, in, in that level. And, yeah. and also, uh, yeah, we've got lots of schools from around Victoria, around Australia that have uh, looked us up and, and have been really interested in our story and, and have come and visited and, and worked on as well. So yeah, the department um, is certainly uh, yeah, moving in this space. I think they're very, uh, very interested in schools learning off each other and and helping each other out and working the evidence out uh, amongst themselves. So a lot of work around professional learning communities and communities of practice. Uh, so we, we feel pretty supported. And as we said, we're happy to host people in learning in our, in our network. And we also uh, are more than happy to learn off other people and what they're doing well as well. Okay. Well, Rebecca's asked, um, how far did you, how far did you have to change your mindset um, perspective um, to bring other, other people along? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it, it can serve in two parts. I, I was basically a Sir Ken Robinson inquiry based uh, uh, <laughs> person. And I think there'd be people that have worked with me that would uh, listen to what I think now and, and think, gee, you've, you, you've, you're saying so some, some many different things, but I think we've always had that idea that explicit instruction is important for novice learners. I think that's inherent in a lot of us. So I had to shift a fair bit, but um, yeah, I, I suppose the more and more I read, the more and more it's just supported across. There's nothing saying that this isn't a good idea. And even the materials that uh, we see that are with inquiry-based learning and, and some other areas that we've probably moved away from with our novice learners, uh, there are good aspects to it and it's just making it all fit in. So I had to shift my mindset a fair bit and I'm happy to do so. And that's the idea of science, isn't it? When things come out and prove something you know, might not be wrong or is it, it might not be right or there's a better way, um, we jump to it quickly. So yeah, I would say that I, I shifted a fair bit with my own experience and then also being informed by the research. Can I just build on that? Was, was that um, as a result of um, one sort of light bulb moment or, or one sort of catalyst or was that more of an incremental thing? Yeah, there was a few things where I just didn't feel that uh, what we tried to implement elsewhere had worked to the effect that I thought it would work. So it wasn't as a wasn't as effective as promised, if uh, for want of a better word. And then coming here and learning about the learning research, uh, the reading research really was that moment. And literally that comment that I presented on out of the reading panel report about phonics. And I, I honestly felt a little bit 
yeah, duped, I suppose, that I, I didn't have that knowledge. And I'd, I've spoken about stories uh, elsewhere where I've dealt with struggling children and in lo lower socioeconomic communities and seeing, you know, what Pam Snow, uh, another LDA um, member, uh, talks about, you know, the, the idea of this, you know, primary school to prison pipeline for some kids that might not be given that. And, and I, I sort of felt that that, that, that learning uh, is really fundamental and I just knew so little about it. And I was really humbled by that experience. And I thought, well, if I don't know that, what else don't I know? Um, that sort of sparked me off on the, on this journey of curiosity and trying to follow people and um, that, that seem to know a lot more about it than me and, and skill up, I suppose. Uh, Monica asked, what was it like educating the broader school community, especially parents about introducing the whole school science of learning based approach? It was uh, the, the kids did the work for me uh, when they were going home with our evidence uh, informed reading instruction and uh, telling their students about, uh, telling their, t their parents about syllable types and um, rules such as gentle Cindy and uh, that don't you know that a, a, a kit makes it sound when it's followed by E, I, or Y, telling me that and uh, going home and sharing that with their, with their teachers. I've had very little resistance from our school community. So I, I think the proof is in the pudding. The kids coming to school and being really engaged and learning better than they ever have um, has really sold that for us. And I must say, even using this approach with the remote learning, we sent home videos that they could download with explicit instruction. It's been the best connection between what our model looks like and what it means for the kids and the, and the parents being able to see their kids activate these learning routines and how they are independent learners and we're not spoon feeding and we're developing learning routines that will, will help these kids for life. Um, that's been a really positive for our school as well. Have I still got people there? I think we're frozen. Still here. How did teachers have time to learn? Sorry, I'm... Uh, You're still there? I'm, I can hear you now, yes. Sorry, mate. So... Uh, I did... Inner asked how long they put this in place and learn all the teach at the same time. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Uh, I I really acknowledged uh, that. I, I think it was about providing time for what what was needed. I pulled a lot of uh, our our leaders out to develop uh, those sorts of things. And really, I suppose if I heard that correctly, it was how did they learn the content and to teach at the same time? Is that correct? I've got people breaking up. I'm sorry. How did they develop the content? Sorry. Yeah. How, how did, they, did they develop the content? Right. So we took a lot um, out from informed things that we looked at. So for instance, if we had phonemic awareness, uh, we used a lot of David Kilpatrick sort of stuff and, and we'd, we'd been engaged with a lot of uh, evidence informed uh, people. So for maths, it might've been at George Booker or, or Steve, Dr. Stephen Norton and things like that. So we had done a lot of PD um, and have ideas about what type of content and how to break that down. Um, and we also use things like spelling mastery as well. So we've sort of got a, got a collection of things that we think are wor have worked and then just g gave teachers the time to sit down and, and uh, break that down. So that's how they've developed the content. And I don't think we've ever, we're continuing to uh, look at that now. We're developing, Developing a lot of science, history, and geography curriculum, and uh, looking at that as well. So, um, trying to source things like the core knowledge curriculum and where the work's already done for us. And uh, so, we, we've got a, a scaffold there to work from and then break it into what we think uh, works for our, our uh, staff. So, hopefully, I've answered that correctly. Sorry, I'm having a few sound issues here. I think I am too, mate. Um, Victoria's asked, how did you persuade resistant teachers to this new evidence-based collaborative approach? Uh, did you experience any staff turnover when your uh, school made the shift? Uh, yeah, yes, we did. Um, it was more, I suppose, a gradual shift towards this is what's done now. So 
we started small. We looked at, it might have been spelling instruction to begin with, with explicit. That became sort of, we must teach explicitly, we must do this, and then um, build our accountability measures and, I suppose, expectations around that. And then it slowly morphed in. You can see what it is now that basically by putting it into the timetable and expecting it's easier to take the lesson than it's, than it's not. So we did have resistant teachers. Um, like we supported the approach really well though like giving teachers materials as i said it was easier to teach it than not um but yeah people that weren't that way inclined or um didn't have that philosophy i do feel we've probably lost a couple along the way that either got jobs elsewhere or or left for greener pastures and um but on the back side of that we've also attracted people that do want to work this way and our probably main form of, um, I suppose, uh, it might be CRTs that come in and just see how well organised it is and and ask ask me directly, or oh, you know, if there are any jobs going, I'd love to be here. So it goes that way as well. It sort of tends to att attract people. But um, yeah, we've definitely lost a couple, I would imagine. Um, nothing explicitly said to me, but um, we also borrow... Lorraine Hammond's uh, just quote sometimes that uh, we're not self-employed. So if you know, <laughs> if we don't like things sometimes, that might be okay for you not to like it, but it's for the, the best for the kids and, and best for the school. Uh, Chris asks, how often do your teachers get feedback on their teaching and who gives the feedback? We've, really good question. I've um, developed uh, self-observation. So teachers looking at, uh, their own videos of their performance and, and comparing that to the EDI model and some of the observations or, and, and one specific area is how we started. Um, we've also uh, read uh, Lorraine's more, I suppose, uh, active coaching model and we've been playing around with that as well. So we've got two um, specialist teachers. They're called specialist teachers, which would be, I, I, I suppose, uh, like leading teachers or leaders, I think in the New South Wales system or something like that, um, where they're, we've worked hard to develop them to go in and actually give feedback. So what they'll do is they'll watch a lesson um, and uh, get, so firstly, they'll plan, plan a lesson together. They'll go in and watch the lesson. There'll be a specific focus. Um, they'll look at some feedback about what the, both people thought they could have done better with the person taking a lead and then the actual coach will take that person's class uh, and demonstrate those improvements. Because what you get sometimes, if you took another class, it's, oh, yeah, you can do that because you haven't got the five kids with ADHD or you haven't got this, you haven't got that. So as I said, seeing's believing. So when our teachers see our, our more expert coach, and you've seen Lorraine do this a million times, she'll come in and take any class anywhere, anytime, and get them operating at a pretty high level. Um, it really does uh, give you no excuses, I suppose, and the belief that your kids can do this. Um, so that's how we go. We, we sort of block that coaching and practice, um, but they give themselves feedback. We give, so that official feedback would be over a, probably six or seven sessions, depending on how, how many are needed. But we also do walkthroughs as well, which is not looking at individual teacher performance. It's looking more at are we maintaining uh, the areas that we want to as a collective. So that's more giving feedback on what we're seeing as a collective of teachers, not individual performance, if that makes sense. So we might be looking at learning intentions and seeing that all learning intentions are there, but we won't judge specific learning intentions for quality or anything like that. So hopefully that gives you some insight. So at least twice a year, they'll give feedback on themselves and we'll give official feedback in our um, coaching model, but that's being developed. We, we want to go further with that. Uh, Claire asks, are you using EDI across all learning subject areas or just literacy and maths? Uh, it's, it's all subject areas. Anything new needs to be taught. And at grades three to six now, we're really modifying uh, our model. We still teach explicitly, but we're looking at deeper processing and uh, looking at ways to facilitate that m more independent. So oh, with novices, as they become more and more proficient, they need guided and, um, and, 
and um, worked examples and things like that. And then we need that gradual release where they can go to, to uh, independent practice. So it's still heavily explicit and guided across all teaching areas, but we're starting to let go, fade out some of our supports and, um, and scaffolding and letting them go into it themselves. So we've still got a lot of work to do and that's what we're working on at grade three to six at the moment is in particular that we've got these kids now that uh, have much less issues than what we used to have in terms of the differentiation. Most kids can kind of spell and do all the basics really well. So we've got that opportunity now to dive into some of the more complex work. Jody asks, uh, how does your approach to literacy flow onto other subjects, especially your load classes? What considerations have you put in place for children that are struggling with English literacy when learning a second language? Yep. Well, we find the, the approaches that we use are highly supportive of uh, students that are, that are struggling. Um, so, yeah, it is the way that the, the brain said. Sarah will pick up on our response to intervention approach. So we've got that uh, 80%, uh, you know, to proficiency before individual practice. Uh, but we do a lot of screening and uh, a lot of, uh, we use dibles three times a year and those kids show up and, and we also have a learning enhancement team that look after our uh, extension kids and also our kids that need support. So uh, kids that come in with uh, little or no English, uh, they'll, they'll receive extra support in vocabulary and oral language and then also build up uh, phonemic awareness, phonics and um, English instruction as well. So we've got a team that's been trained to deal, deal with that. Sharon asks, can you teach an old dog new tricks? How do you go converting older teachers who are set in their ways? Or do you prefer novice teachers so you can train them? Ah, good question. Well, novice is, uh, it, it's interesting on how you take a novice. So a novice is skilled and knowledge based, not so much years experience, but uh, yes, you can teach an old dog uh, new tricks. I think that, uh, it, it's about the buy-in. It's about uh, the belief that you can change a practice. And some of our effective teachers that are, that are more experienced, uh, it's giving labels to be able, for them to be able to identify good practice. So we might look at activate prior knowledge or relevance or something like that. And I'll say, Oh yeah, I've always known that's a good teaching practice. I just didn't know what it was called. So there's, there's ability for, for people to label what's good about their practice. And I think that's, what's uh, really productive about having a shared idea and shared labels about what it is that we're trying to do with our kids and what we think is effective so they can self-identify so yep there might be a, a person stuck in their ways uh, and and defense certain areas that they want to keep but we, we can kind of pull those conversations out and and there's always uh, one area or, or an area that we can build on that people can do better and we haven't really had too much resistance to that idea that yep, there's certain things that uh, you can do that, that are effective. We'll leave those alone, but what's an area you can improve? And most people have come along for the ride. Carolyn asks, what's the difference between evidence and research-based, et cetera? Can evidence just be anecdotal? Uh, no, I like to uh, try and... It, it's. <laughs> That is that is a minefield area. Um, so we talk about evidence informed. I, I know that the, a lot of the the stuff that we look at from the cognitive side, science, educational, uh, psychology research, and things like that are, are lab um, generated things, and we know that can't be exactly replicated in the classroom. So there is always an element of guessing in how this would work. But that's the research to to practice gap that I think is an opportunity for us to to work. Uh, with and be creative in that space and, and work with our researchers and things like that. Um, I'm very wary of anecdotal evidence because particularly in education, because everything works to some degree, there's, there's so many practices about, you, you know, um, you look at circle time and, and sharing stories and things like that, like what, or, or meditation or, you know, what would you say? No, nothing sounds outwardly, uh, you know, uh, a bad idea and the, you can always argue it has a benefit for the kids, but it's what has the most benefit. We've got very limited time in our six and a half hour, hours a day. What, what gives us the biggest bang for our buck and most, uh, the, the, the most impact. So that's where we try and spend our time on our instruction and um, some of our review processes like that 
and again, it depends on the context uh, of your school. If if uh, we're very lucky at Bentley West Primary School, probably more um, you know advantaged. Uh, but I've worked in in other schools where yeah, that 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 that, uh, that shift might change depending on the needs of your kids. Uh, Julie has asked, how has changing to EDI impacted on learning and support? So positively on, on learning and given us support, uh, I suppose, a, v a very much clear direction on what needs to happen. So as I said in the, uh, with the key understandings, it's, it's a new idea of what it means to be at level at our, at our school. So our support, when you go and look at the kids that um, are in that, uh, may not even be below the level. So what I suppose this approach does is allow our support team to see what's coming up in the future and, and, and how that's going to be planned. So sometimes we preload our kids uh, with uh, the, the, the lessons and the things that they're about to experience. So if the second or third time that they hear that in their actual class. So I think that support's been given clearer direction. It's aligned to our mainstream practice, our tier one mainstream practice. So I would say it's uh, been positive in both both realms at the, at the very top at the mainstream and then also for our learning enhancement uh, students as well. And to give that give an example about that I remember showing um, someone around uh, to our learning enhancement it was grade twos and they said oh so you do this for advanced kids as well and they were actually um, uh, one of the groups that had been identified that needed to keep up uh, with the standards so I, I think uh, it's a new way of thinking um, of keeping making sure that tail doesn't get too long, particularly prep to two. Uh, Broden has asked, did your school investigate the use of proficiency scales and found the way you broke down the curriculum and structured it was more user friendly or time appropriate? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm unaware of proficiency scale. So um, I'm not really, uh, can't really comment on that, but uh I, I suppose what we've really learned to use is the learning intention in EDI. There's a really clear breakdown of concept and skill development there that uh, we learned that we couldn't really engage with, with the way that our curriculum was. So we had to break down key understandings into a way that would be broken into meaningful learning intentions and then sequence those learning intentions together. So that's the model that we've used to sort of break down um, those bigger chunks of learning into sequence lessons to, to develop that community of learning and then review them as well with space and interleave practice and retrieval practice. Carla's asked, uh, said, Steve, you have the autonomy to determine your school-based curriculum as we do in New Zealand. Have you experienced that the state curriculum is now not an accurate representation of what you know to be current research and evidence-based instruction across learning areas? Uh, yeah, there, there's certainly aspects that, um, th that we look at. And as I said, to, to fit it into an EDI model, we've definitely had to rectify things. So as we know that the curriculums are, are wide, uh, yeah, but there's certainly things in there that might not... Um, you know, make too much sense in, in terms of the, uh, uh, in, in, with, with some of the descriptors and, and things like that in there. And I know there was a huge debates with the academics and things around decoding and things like that. So I try and stay out of those debates as much as I can. I, um, I, I try and use what's there, but uh, you can certainly see how some uh, practitioners might be confused in, in some of the things that, that are there. And just the, I think we found when you want to write the learning intentions and things like that, just to be a bit more concrete about what we wanted to put into our learning intentions and things like that. So the Victorian curriculum certainly allows you to do that and, um, and give you the autonomy to work with on. as a guide. Uh, hopefully that uh, answers the question. Susan, uh, Susan asks, um, you mentioned Lorraine Hammond and that was on one day. Yes. Uh, what other longer term PD did your staff engage in? So we broke down our EDI model over, uh, we're still doing it every <laughs> uh, Monday nights. We try and um, have, have a professional learning uh, based meeting if we can and uh, a more extended uh, idea on that. So we are still, 
even this year, like this is six years down the track, uh, still breaking down learning intentions, going through what it means to us, going through act, activate prior knowledge, uh, relevance. As we said, we looked at deep, deep processing. How can we make the kids uh, link learning to prior knowledge and also to their emotional experience and things like that to build better memories and things like that. So we just keep going deeper and deeper with the, uh, with the EDI. So it's a part of our everyday practice. It's a part of everything that we do. So it's never gone away with Lorraine was just the, uh, came in and had the know-how and uh, the explanation of why we do things and how EDI protects working memory and things like that. And why it's such a great idea. And then it, it took off from there. It was, um, yeah, we, we were looking for something. We are looking for a, a consistent model. And as I said, it operationalize, operationalizes what, what to do. So I remember the alarm going off on a Sunday and wondering, I uh, kept getting security guard uh, phone calls and everyone was moving their desks into rows and putting dots on their floors and all sorts of things. So she had a huge impact, but we've tried to sustain that momentum over six years. Uh, Monica's asked, is that self-assessment with the recorded lessons similar to the kind of video reflexive ethnography that's increasingly used in medical settings to improve practice? Um, so was the question about uh, what type of sort of video software you use? Yeah, the, the, refl the reflection lessons, yeah. Yeah, so lessons. we've got a, um, a model. It's not, it's not supposed to be a check, tick the box. It's more to help guide you and notice what you're seeing in your own practice and, and work out. Uh, so for instance, we might look at uh, engagement norms or, you know, like pair or tap or how we're we using pair share. And I'm just going to focus on that. And I might count how many times I use it and how I use it. And I might be just using it to get the kids to recite things back to me. And then we might put a challenge out that, well, how can we make the kids use pair share to, process information a little bit deeper and you know off to you see if you can work it into your practice and uh and then we'll do a an observation or a um a video observation again and you can compare that to your practice and that might be your term or, or two terms worth of work because it takes a long time to build in new teacher habits and and um and uh, practices because we're effectively trying to change behavior so that's how we use it. It's very rudimentary. We, we, uh, we tried the swivel and all those sorts of things, but we found the good old trusty iPhone or computer at the back of the um, classroom um, is sufficient. Uh, and Sarah's just built on what you said too about uh, Lorraine's work and you had Joe Yabara and so on. So she's just made that comment. Chris has asked the question there, uh, has teachers watching an expert teaching their class backfired in the sense that they feel they can't replicate what the expert can do. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's particularly with our, our guys that come in first day, it, it's very overwhelming when you look at the proficiency and the pace that, that, that the teaching, the teaching's at. So we do a lot of work uh, pre coming in um, to sort of prepare everyone and then show them how they're supported. And, and, and ex we don't expect that if you can just get through the lessons, uh, you know, the kids will drag you along, uh, but also uh, you're not expected to do this. You're just expected to get your head around this and don't worry in, in a couple of weeks, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll pick it up. So really being supportive, really making our expectations clear, particularly when people first start. And yes, you're right. Um, you know, people look at that and, and it could be a confidence diminishing thing, but we're very careful in the goals that we set and the support that we give and we say, okay, you've just seen this amazing lesson. What, what one part can you take and improve next week? Because that's, that's what it's about. And we're going to give you the time to develop that and get better at it. And people start to see that that's all we're after. We're just after everyone trying their best, everyone trying to change their practice for the better. And we can't ask any more of you than that. That that's, that's all, that's all we ask for that effort and uh, to get, to get better and, and um, yeah, it, it seems to be very comfortable. People feel really comfortable and actually invite feedback and invite observations. Kim asks, what is your advice for a multi-age classroom in a small school? Yeah, it's a huge problem. And um, we've, we've gone out and partnered with a couple of um, small school, schools and, and done reviews. And 
and this has come up and I've asked our, our leaders to have, have a look at it. I, I'd really look at uh, wh where the baseline is, where, where we would like to uh, have the kids um, uh, extended to. And you can differentiate within your, your examples, your, your uh, worked examples, and then also your um, independent practice uh, and guided practice. So you could do it. It's, it's harder to take a, a little bit more planning um, but I still think you can have effective classroom instruction because we've always got that variance to a certain degree. Um, but if you're teaching grade sixes and preps all in the same class, well, maybe it would be worthwhile breaking them up into groups and, and, and trying to uh, tackle it that way. But uh, yeah, good, good question. That's a, a hard one. I haven't, I haven't experienced that yet, and, but uh, I'm sure, sure it could be done. Uh, Carolyn's asked, has made a comment there seems to be more research around junior years in reading and not as much in senior what approach you're using for reading in senior and then susan's built on that and yep. and uh asked what does structured literacy and direct instruction look like in years four five and six i know what it is in the early years but i'm grappling with older kids and how to get this right yeah um, and you're not alone there because, uh, yeah, we've, we've also looked at that. So initially when our students didn't have the skills and the, and the gaps, uh, we were very much like prep to two and still sort of teaching, um, uh, a lot of similar things, uh, to the kids cause they didn't have, uh, that proficiency and we've got some growth there. But since, uh, we're looking at the, the older years now, we're building a lot more on um, the writing revolution strategies and looking at how you can use uh, sentence level work and uh, written responses to demonstrate, uh, 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 I suppose, reading comprehension and focusing not on reading comprehension strategies per se, but actually building knowledge. So looking at the core, uh, core knowledge curriculum and things like that and actively teaching our history, geography, our science more, and expecting the reading and the writing responses to come from there. So we move past that sort of decoding level and building the language comprehension in our younger years, uh, overlaying that to more task structures. So we might do novel studies, we might do you know, uh, history readings with tasks attached to that and starting to pull out those longer comprehension responses via writing. So we know the kids have to process really well through writing and answering questions in full sentences and things like that to demonstrate uh, what they've learned via their reading instruction, rather than just focus on reading comprehension strategies. Uh, Surabi has, uh, has said, great presentation. Steve, do you, have you had any researchers collect and publish data pre-post since your school moved to EDI, which may also help promote evidence-based practices in other schools? Uh, we haven't had uh, any official uh, data collection outside of NAPLAN and, and things like that. We have had uh, people offer um, and, and come in and, and interview our teachers. Uh, I'm sure everyone saw the Latrobe announcement of going to the solar. Um, uh, it was in, in uh, the paper the other day. Um, we've done a lot of work with um, certain researchers around there that have come uh, and interviewed our teachers and our approach. Um, but no, we haven't had anything official in terms of um, looking at pre and post data with a, with a proper study, so to speak. Um, yeah, just anecdotal on what we've sort of, we present. Uh, Jackie, yes, we will be putting this up on our YouTube channel. So if you, um, if you just uh, search in YouTube for Learning Difficulties Australia, our YouTube channel will come up. This, will, this presentation will be up in a few days with Steve's permission. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah's commented about some other things that um, the school uses, the vocabulary workshop and novel studies. Yep. Uh, Chris has asked, we, we use an EDI approach with year five, six, sevens for spelling morphology vocab sent our teachers to Joey Barron and Lorraine Hammond. Yep. That wasn't a question. Um, Boyd asks, can you list other schools in the SAGE network, i.e. following the same or similar practices? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not too sure. I know that uh, 
um, we've got partners in Coatesville that are, um, which is just around the corner looking at that. I think most of our, um, a lot of our schools actually uh, have, have definitely looked at um, the reading intervention in particular and looking at, um, I suppose, synthetic phonics sort of teaching and training and implement it to other levels. But no, I don't think there's many schools that have gone to the level in terms of uh, the explicit approach that, that we have that I know about in the, in the SAGE network. They've picked up bits and pieces and, and aspects of it. And certainly with our partnerships in the maths um, partnership, uh, there, there's been elements of what we've done and schools got their different contexts and different ideas. So I, I wouldn't think we're reasonably unique in, in our approach, but more, more coming along the way, I think. So, um, and taking aspects of what has worked with our, our model as well. Now I've skipped along with uh, a few that were just sort of not, not really questions, just thinking and that sort of thing. Jackie asks a question, how many schools do you know that use EDI? I would love to know. Do I know? Um, well, there's a, a, a few Western Australian schools um, that, that were visited and um, Lorraine sort of introduced us to over there. I know West Beachborough, um, Ray Boyd, uh, principal over there. There's uh, Danny, Daliana uh, Heights uh, a while ago. I haven't seen them for a while, but um, and also I think it was Dawson's Park in Western Australia, ones that I've looked at and know. Um, I'm or there's Blue Haven in New South Wales. Um, yeah, they're, they're the ones just off the, the top of my head, but um, yeah. If you want to um, email us, Jackie, I can probably give you some more schools. I don't, depending where you are, uh, I know of quite a few uh, around the country, um, across most states. So um, if you want to send us an email, um, send me an email at LDA. Yeah, um, general dot general manager at ldaustralia.org. Um, a few more thank yous. There's also a few in Adelaide. Chris has just mentioned and that indeed there are. Um, Carolyn's asked the same question about schools in Victoria using the same model. So I think you've kind of answered that. I've got to move through them because we've got 51 new questions that we haven't even got to yet. Um, and I, we might be here till midnight, Steve, unless <laughs> I, um, uh, hurry this up. Um, Lancaster Public Schools always grateful for your support. Yeah, Small Lancaster school and is definitely one. Uh, now I've just got open the chat. I haven't seen it myself. So and that's a multi-age one. So the, the question earlier on around multi-age, they might yep. um, get something from talking to Lancaster. Yeah, um, I think it's Jackie Burrows in uh, Churchill in Morwell as well. Um, has done a lot of work with us. Um, so yeah, there's. Uh, Chelsea Primary School. Uh, our, our assistant principal here went there, so they're moving to that approach as well. Rebecca asks an interesting question. What advice would you give a principal who wasn't on board with the science of reading and response to intervention? Uh, um, I'm not too sure. Um, I think it would be... We're not on board with it. I, I, I don't know. I'd have to know why that was it. Uh, you know, that they, they didn't know, like I, I might've been not on board with it as well, but just didn't know, <laughs> you know, uh, or, or if I'd read all, all the, all the research um, and then was still against it. I'm, I'm not too sure. That's a hard one, Rebecca. That, that is. And that's probably going to be our last question actually, Rebecca. So thanks for ending on a, on a quite a difficult note. I would say almost could be a controversial note. Um, and Steve's been uh, quite diplomatic in his answer. Catherine's just added there that New South Wales, Maitland Christian School um, and a few other schools there use an EDI, EDI approach. Um, no worries, Rebecca. <laughs> there's quite a, quite a few schools in the Newcastle region that are, that are using um, explicit instruction. There's quite a few in North Queensland, some in the uh, Brisbane, Logan, Gold Coast, uh, Ipswich area in, in Queensland. Yeah, I, I, think, I think most schools would use uh, that, uh, what is it, release of uh, 
gradual release of to, to certain degrees. It's just the different yeah. degrees. I think it's, I think most schools would use some sort of explicit instruction model at some level. That some of them think they do. I think you touched <laughs> on that at the start. That, that means different things to different people. Yeah. Uh, Sharon's asked what schools in Adelaide. So if anyone can put that up, um, I think Chris was talking about the Adelaide schools um, previously. So if Chris, if you're still on there, uh, that would be great to add. So just to, to wrap things up, I know it's after seven o'clock. Um, really like to thank Steve for doing a wonderful presentation. There you go. Craig Byrne Public School in Adelaide. Thanks, Paul, for putting that up. Um, but thanks so much, Steve. It's, it's been a, a wonderful presentation. Great to hear all the terrific work that you're doing there um, at Bentley West. Um, hopefully we might be able to do a bit with you later, later this year. I want to talk to you about that in the coming days, yep. um, for LDA, but, um, thanks so much. Just on next week, um, Sally Robinson Cooey, uh, who I, um, told everybody last week was on this week. I got mixed up with my dates. So apologies there. She'll be, um, talking about, uh, explicit instruction, um, for, non-English speaking background. She's an expert um, in TESOL and is a consultant for uh, non-English background communities. So um, I look forward to Sally's presentation next week. Steve's presentation will be up on YouTube um, as soon as I can upload it. And that normally takes me a long time, unfortunately, but um, thanks so much for everyone's time tonight and um, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right, I've stopped recording, I think. Yeah.